our third webinar session for the year. And for your information, all the recordings for our previous webinar session uh, could also be viewed on MPC Teamwork TV, uh, which is accessible via MPC's YouTube channel. Do check it and share and like our video so that other people will also gain some knowledge from this webinar. And there were also various informative videos uploaded on our YouTube channel. So please check uh, them out. And before we begin our session, I have a few housekeeping notes. If you have any questions for the presenter, please submit your questions by typing the questions into the Q&A box on your screen. And you can also use the chat feature in the Zoom webinar as well. You can post your question at any time during the presentation and we will later address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Um, today's session will also be recorded and available for viewing post later at our MPC Steamer TV YouTube channel. And if you require a certificate of attendance for this session, please let me know by sending your email to nornajwa, N-O-R-N-A-J-J-U-A at mpc.com.ny and I will later uh, make the necessary arrangement uh, for it. So um, later I will put it inside the chat box as well, okay? Uh, thank you for your attention and let's proceed with our next agenda. So now I would like to welcome Mr. Mohtar Suhaili from Leisure Timber Council, our CEO, to deliver his welcoming remarks. The floor is yours. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning uh, to everyone. And thank you very much to Najwa as our MC uh, for today. And uh, I would like to thank as well uh, our speaker for today, uh, Mr. Mr. Melvin. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, kindness to, to be with us today. And this is the Timber Talk series. Yeah? And basically, this Timber Talk series that we are having today is the third session since uh, we introduced this program. And it's a pleasure that uh, through this uh, uh, Timber Talk series, we have uh, many renowned architects. And today we have architect, uh, I call this architect uh, Melvin. And uh, I hope that uh, with uh, his sharing uh, session, we'll get more insights on, uh, on uh, our, our industry here. Yeah? So actually, the, 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 in MTC, we have a few initiatives or few uh, programs where we want to create uh, awareness uh, to, uh, to educate uh, not only the timber industry, but also the, uh, what we call this, the, uh, the public about uh, the building, uh, building uh, using, uh, using timber. So this is one of our efforts to educate and provide insights into the best design practices, uh, latest uh, innovations and knowledge sharing of interesting case studies from the leading experts in the building and architectural sector. And the purpose of this webinar is to spark interest among users and specifiers of the real, very real advantages uh, of using sustainable, uh, sustainably produced uh, tropical timber as a built material, as well as to encourage more uh, timber usage, uh, timber, timber usage in projects. Uh, in projects, actually, there are a few. Uh, if you can see that um, uh, visit, when we visited uh, uh, various uh, overseas countries, you can see that more and more countries they are that encouraging people to use timber, even for high-rise buildings. Uh, for example, in Norway, uh, in, uh, in even in Australia, in New Zealand, in uh, uh, in Sweden, and so on. They are now trying to encourage people. To move from the uh, uh, from other uh, building materials to to uh, uh, to timber or wood wooden materials, because for us timber is the, not only for us but actually it's uh, the fact shows that the timber is the most sustainable, uh, the most uh, uh, re uh, reusable, and then the most uh, uh, what you call this the most uh, effective uh, way in terms of uh, most environmental uh, friendly uh, materials for building for, for, for uh, to be used in a uh, construction to be used in uh, uh, development industry and so on. So these are the, actually the intention of what we are, why we are ha having this uh, timber talks from time to time. And, and today we are very fortunate uh, because we have this uh, Mr. Architect Melvin, based on his CV that I have in front of me now. So he has been in the industry for 26 years. 
and uh, known uh, for creating eco-friendly sustainable architectural designs while keeping Malaysian identity as a constant uh, factor to create works with outstanding uh, standing results. So you can see that the keywords there is a Malaysian uh, identity uh, in, uh, in, his, uh, in, his, uh, in his works. So thank you very much, uh, Architect Melvin, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, you can share more insights and more valuable uh, advisors or maybe uh, strategies on how we can ensure that the timber industry, the timber, uh, timber wood, uh, wood can be uh, usage can be enhanced further in this in this country. And maybe we should go also for green now, uh, uh, building materials using timber. So all these the ideas that we have uh, as part of our uh, effort of. Uh, designing for a resilient uh, planet uh, that uh, more and more people are talking when you're talking about ESG, when we're talking about a sustainable uh, development goals and so on. So I think uh, once again, I would like to thank all the timber industry players that are with, uh, with us today. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, we have a good uh, blend of uh, participants today. Um, let me see the list that uh, we are having here today. So I think uh, we have a very good uh, blend of uh, participants here. We have 70 participants. Uh, I think this is a very good, uh, I call this very good uh, feedback from the industry. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, many familiar faces, many families, familiar names as well. Uh, I think some of them are uh, architect, some of them are timber industry players, and so on. Uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this your your support for this uh, for this talk is really. Uh, uh, I call this uh, really uh, in, uh, motivate us to do more in terms of uh, for this uh, type of timber talks in the future. So I don't want to prolong my welcoming remarks, by the way. So once again, I'd like to thank uh, architect uh, Melvin uh, for his uh, uh, for agreeing to be our our speaker for for today. But unfortunately, then I cannot join until the end. Uh, my schedule is quite packed today, so uh, uh, maybe I join the session for 10, uh, 10 15 minutes. So by ten thirty, I need to leave the session. But anyway, uh, architect Melvin, thank you very much for joining us. I really once again appreciate your uh, attendance today and all the timber industry players and the public that joining us from the architect, from the construction um, builders, and so on. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mota, for the welcome remarks. So our topic today is Designing for a Resilient Planet by architect Melvin J. Kenny. Uh, let me introduce a bit uh, what uh, architect Melvin has over 26 years of experience in the construction and property development industry. He graduated from Barlett Schools of Architecture in 1990 and did his postgraduate studies at South Bank University, London. He returned to Malaysia in 1993 and worked for a few architectural firms before starting his own practice in 2003. He has won numerous awards, namely Asia Pacific Property Awards, PAM Commendation Awards, PAM Gold and Silver Awards, Luxury Lifestyle Awards, and Idea I Property Development Excellence Award. Since then, he has been creating a positive buzz within the industry for his design ethos and creating homes that are astounding. Without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker today, Architect Melvin, to deliver his presentation. Over to you, Ar uh, Architect Melvin, for the, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, selamat pagi, very good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you to MPC for giving me this opportunity to speak um, on this very, very interesting topic, designing for a resilient planet. Um, so just give me a second while I share the screen. All right. Okay. Um, as I said, it's a very, very important and pertinent uh, topic uh, that we're talking about, designing for a resilient planet. Um, our planet has been a very resilient planet because it's been around for more than 4 billion years. But it's amazing that human beings in the last 100 years have managed to bring our, our planet to the brink of, well, I, would, I wouldn't say destruction, but a brink of uh, serious catastrophes, right? Just from our human activities. Um, so I want to share this image. We are now in 2022. There is a roadmap uh, by the uh, Paris Agreement that by 2050, 
we need to take drastic measures to change, um, I guess, the way we live, the way we build, the way we consume energy in order to save the planet. Um, now, based on a research, research that's coming out, the uh, global temperature and carbon dioxide emissions have gone up significant, significant, significantly over the last 100 years. If you look at this graph from 1880, it's been constantly going up and it keeps going up further and further. Uh, the, the global temperatures have gone up by about 1.5 degrees. So the Paris Agreement is trying to say that, look, we got to keep this, this temperature within the 1.5 degrees. If not, there will be serious consequences. Um, and we're talking about flooding, rising of sea levels, glaciers are now actually melting, um, and temperatures are going up, right? So what is it that we can do about this? If you look at the um, countries, the biggest contributors are China. China's number one in terms of uh, uh, gas emissions, followed by United States and Europe. And just these countries alone, contribute to more than half of the uh, global emissions. So what does this tell us? It tells us that countries that are developed are actually consuming more energy and are also biggest polluters. Uh, Malaysia is still not there yet, but um, all of us, uh, whatever small contribution we make is going to make a difference. So we need to actually start um, taking drastic measures. Now, the uh, Paris Agreement roadmap, uh, we are look, they are looking at reducing greenhouse emissions by 45% in the next, uh, well, up to 2030. But based on current trends, we are going to actually increase it by 14%. So that's a huge difference. Uh, does it mean we will achieve it by 2030? My honest opinion is probably not. Um, at the rate we are going, it's not, it's not going to be something that's achievable. Um, yeah, the other thing is, um, sorry, yeah, let me. The other thing is by 2050, we are supposed to reach net zero emissions. This is the target by 2050. Now, if, if we can achieve this, it means that we can contain the increase in global temperatures by 1.5 degrees, which is very optimistic. And this graph shows here uh, what's going to happen in terms of global temperatures, right? So if you see the, the bottom figure, the blue line, if we manage to achieve these targets by the Paris Agreement, we can keep the temperatures roughly around that 1.5 degree mark. You can just see it. You can just see it here. It's blue line here. If we don't, you see the red line. If we continue doing what we're doing, temperatures are just going to keep on increasing until to a stage where it reaches about four degrees above the current temperatures. Now, if that happens, it is going to be global catastrophe at a very very huge level. But what is most likely going to happen is we're going to reach something in between. Uh, shown in the orange and the light blue lines here, maybe a global temperatures increase of about two degrees, which is still manageable, but we will still have to live with the, the effects of global warming. So what is it that we as architects and designers can do? Um, are we as architects guilty to contributing to global warming? I think the answer is definitely yes, because we are in the front line of development. We are, we are the uh, people who actually advise our client in terms of what needs to be done um, and how to build um, sustainably. So what is it that we can all do collectively to contribute to the Paris Agreement? Um, we have come up, I think uh, all of you know, the GBI, Green Building Index, is a Malaysian uh, rating system and also Green Ray. Um, but worldwide, uh, every country has different systems. We've got a lead from US, we've got BCA Green Mark from Singapore, and we've got BREAM from uh, Europe. Now, these are just tools. They're tools to tell you how green your building is. But from lessons that I've learned, it is not really that difficult to get, you know, gold or platinum scoring. All you need to, 
is to concentrate on active systems. Now, what, are, what do I mean by active systems? In a building, uh, there's basically two systems, a, a passive and active system, right? So an active system is where we concentrate more on like um, um, solar power cells, PV cells, mechanical systems uh, to, to help with ventilation, air conditioning systems that are uh, efficient. So these are all active systems, right? Um, but the best system is still the passive system. And why I say this is there is zero cost. When you build a building from scratch, you should start looking at the passive system first before you even look at the active system. And what I mean by passive is that the architecture of the building relates and corresponds to its environment in the way that the roof is designed. Sorry. Um, the way we uh, place windows at the right location to reduce uh, solar gain, but to increase ventilation, um, to create shading devices, to use uh, greenery and screen planting. These are all no cost, but it's just the placement and the design that makes a whole lot of difference. Um, I just want to share this image um, courtesy of Pittman Architects. It's got these three images. In the 19th century, houses were very simple and they just had a fireplace, right, to keep them warm. But we are now in the 20th century where we've come up with all these complex active systems, right, from advanced uh, aircon systems, uh, advanced um, power generation equipment to assist to make our buildings green. But I think in the future, 21st century, buildings will be back to simple buildings where we use the architecture of the building using a passive system, very, very simple, to use less energy and to create buildings that are inherently green. So our philosophy has always been on the passive, uh, passive design uh, strategies that we do in all our projects. So I just want to share with you some of the ideas that we, that we use. These are very, very basic. I think a lot of us know it, but it's important how we actually apply it to our projects. So first thing is site orientation and response to the environment, how a building is placed, you know, very obvious things like you want to keep your Western and Eastern wall small and larger surface area on your Northern and Southern uh, walls, less windows, you know, where you have the morning sun, and evening sun. You want to design the, the building so that it maximizes uh, wind flow based on the wind direction. Um, the design of the openings also make a difference, whether high level openings, low level openings make a difference in terms of how air and ventilation enters the building. The building envelope is also very important, the external walls, right? Uh, because a lot of solar gain comes from heat absorption from the walls. So the type of material that we use for the walls is important, especially walls that are facing eastern and western uh, facades. Um, so heat actually through solar radiation through, and through conduction actually gets into the house. So there are various ways of actually treating this, either using insulation methods or using cavity construction, some of which I will share later. Majority of heat gain is from the roof. So your roof is probably the most important element in your design, um, especially here in Malaysia, right? And uh, by designing it correctly, you can reduce heat actually coming into your building. Um, so the other thing is the, the material of the building that we need to look at. We need to avoid materials with high thermal mass. Now, what I mean by high thermal mass is materials like brick and concrete. Although they're great uh, in not conducting heat, but they actually absorb heat and they store it and they release it into the building very, very slowly. Um, which is why in European countries, they love bricks because it keeps the building warm, right? Um, use of materials with low thermal mass and low conductivity, like timber and drywalls and light materials are the best materials to use. Um, so the image at the bottom, you can see on the left is a brick house and on the right is a timber house. Um, thank you, courtesy of MTC. I took that picture off your website. Um, as we know, the Kampong house is the perfect house uh, in terms of materials that is used, right? 
Um, what's great about timber is that they have low conductivity and very low thermal mass. So they do not store heat. The other thing is to, to look at is windows facing uh, eastern and western facades. I know here in Malaysia, we like to use uh, double glazing, triple glazing, low E glass and things like that. Uh, but isn't it better to try to use a passive way where we can have you know, glass with, um, with a, a, a nice roof overhang so you still have the views, but you keep the heat out and keep the sun out where it matters, right? So encourage the usage of sun shading devices and roof eaves, uh, which we do a lot in our projects. Ventilation is extremely important in the uh, tropical climate because our temperatures, indoor temperatures range from 27 to 33 degrees. We need to bring it down to about 23 to 26 in order for, it, for you to be comfortable without the use of air conditioning. And how we do this is to create air movement because air movement, when it touches your skin through evaporation, you feel cooling, right? So how do we create this? Cross ventilation is one of the methods, having windows on opposite sides of the room or the building, um, having what's called a stack effect. So a stack effect is uh, air entering the build building from a lower level where the air is cool as the air warms up, it rises up and, and discharges from the roof level, right? So when you have pitch roof with openings on the top, it allows the air to escape. And this creates like what I call a microclimate. Air is continuously moving by itself. So this helps with um, ventilation and keeping air movement. Now materials, what sort of materials are are good that we should consider in a green building. Obviously, you want to avoid materials that are high energy production, for example, steel, aluminium, um, unless it's from a recycled source. Uh, these, these are, I wouldn't say green materials, right? Avoid materials that, that, from natural, not, that are from natural non-renewable sources. Marble and stone, right? These are all limited resources on our planet. Try to use recycled or reconstituted materials instead. So nowadays we are reconstituted marble, for example. So you can use less of natural resources and always go for renewable materials like timber, for example. Uh, the other thing is to use local materials. And why we say use local materials is we want to reduce the carbon footprint from transportation, especially overseas countries, right? It's huge green huge uh, carbon uh, footprint when you import materials. Okay, so what are the timber materials that we can use? Local timber, um, we should always try to specify FSC or PFC certified uh, local timber. Um, and I know certain species is very, very hard to get, for example, Chengal and Balau, because these are, are very um, long growing. It takes a very long time for these uh, timber to mature. 50 to 100 years. So they're not really uh, renewable in that sense. But there are other, a whole lot of other species like Merbao, Maranti, Miato that we've used, which are um, from sustainable um, managed forest. Uh, the other type of timber that we've used is thermal wood. Now, what's great about thermal wood is it's using soft wood. Now, soft wood cannot be used in, uh, in the tropics. It's too soft. So we use thermal wood and once it's treated uh, under high temperatures, it actually becomes quite durable. Uh, but we still can't use it on external facades because of our heat um, and weather, but we can actually use it on the interiors. We can use it for ceiling linings. Um, it's a great uh, other green material that, to consider. The other one is CLT, cross laminated timber. I think this has uh, become a real buzzword in Europe, especially the building towers that are going up to 30 stories high just using this material. It's just amazing. I, I hope that Malaysia, uh, maybe MTC can actually uh, do more research on this material to see how we can actually use it in Malaysia. Um, I think there's, with timber, there's always the fear of fire, right? Uh, so obviously it's being used in, in these countries uh, and there's a good reason, I think CLT, is actually very, very fire resistant. Um, so it is something that we should seriously consider. The fourth item is bamboo. Now bamboo is the fastest growing timber that we know of, right? It's an amazing material. Um, 
But unfortunately, in Malaysia, it's still at its infancy. We are not taking advantage. Countries like Thailand and Indonesia are much more advanced when it comes to use of bamboo. So I hope this is another area where we can actually cultivate the use of uh, uh, bamboo in a, in a much bigger and more sustainable way. Because I, I would love to use this material, but I'm always advised by my contractor, oh, no, don't use the Malaysian one. The quality is no good. We have to import. And when it comes to import bamboo, I, I am totally against it. Uh, the other material that we're using quite a lot these days is WPC, wood plastic composites. Now, this is actually made out of recycled um, timber and recycled plastic. Um, what's great about this material is that they are extremely durable. So we don't want to be using uh, timber like, like Chengal and Balau too much because they are, um, as I said earlier, slow growing materials, right? So WPC makes an excellent substitute for, for durable timber in areas where you actually need it. Now, coming back to masonry walls. Now, brick walls, um, the good thing about brick walls is that they are low embodied energy, low energy uh, material, meaning that you don't need a lot of heat to, um, to create uh, bricks, right? They are also very good insulators. But the problem is they can become thermal masses. So we need to look at that issue. And I will explain later how we can treat that. And of course, bricks are locally available from nearby sources. And uh, if it's done correctly and done nicely, you don't need to plaster and you don't need to paint brick. You can leave it natural and it's very beautiful, right? The other thing to look at is low VOC materials. Now, in a, in a building, there are a lot of toxic materials within the building itself. So we need to create healthy internal environments. And to do that, we need to specify low VOC. Now, the main sources of VOC is adhesives from plywood, chipboard, veneers. It's actually within the material itself. And again, I've been finding it very difficult to get local materials that have got low VOC. We always have to import, which is unfortunate. But I hope this is one area that Malaysia will develop um, because in countries like um, Europe and even Japan, um, there is regulation. You cannot use low VOC uh, uh, inside the building. Malaysia, we still haven't got that regulation yet, but I think this is something that we need to look at seriously because formally height that comes from cabinets, especially your cabinet, your carpentry, um, is within the cabinets and the wardrobe. They are there for a very, very long time. They don't go away. Yeah, so this is something that we should look at. Um, water saving, I think this is now a norm. It's standard already. Rainwater housing systems and water saving uh, fittings are used in buildings. And lastly, I'll touch on is greening and landscape. Now, this is the cheapest way to green the planet. All you've got to do is plant a seed and you get trees, you get plants. And I'm showing this picture. This picture is a uh, park royal that Singapore done by Woha. Singapore has been making extremely uh, amazing strides in producing buildings that are green. When I say green, meaning uh, landscape green, right? So they're increasing the green footprint. Um, if any of you went for the recent uh, World Expo in Dubai, uh, Singapore um, Pavilion was a tropical jungle. That's what they built, uh, basically a tropical jungle in the desert. It was, it was amazing. Um, I think Malaysia can do the same. But the problem with uh, Malaysia is that we have this mentality of, oh, you know, maintenance problem now. You know, who's going to maintain the, the garden? Who's going to maintain the green? I think this is something that we have to live with, um, especially in the face of global warming. This is something that it just has to be done. It's no longer a nice to have, but it's something that should be by right a regulation. Uh, so this, this image, again, of the... Uh, uh, Kampong House meets all the criteria I just mentioned, meaning that it's used using sustainable timber. Um, it, it, it doesn't store heat. Um, it's raised above the ground, so cool air from below can enter the house from below through the floorboards and into the house. The envelope is uh, at the skin of the building is, is, is um, allows air to actually enter. So, so it is an ideal building material for the tropics. And it lives within its environment um, in a very comfortable way, a very natural way. 
But unfortunately, we can't keep on building like this because uh, timber is a limited resources, especially when you talk about uh, real durable hardwood. So what are the lessons can, that we can learn from the Kampong House? What are lessons that we can apply in modern buildings? This is what we should be looking at. So I want to share some of the case studies of projects that we've done using purely using uh, passive design. Um, and the first project I want to talk about is the uh, Kampong Tugu Banglo, which is my own house, which was built uh, about 10 years ago. Um, GBI was introduced about, I think, 11, 11, 12 years ago. So this, when GBI was just introduced, um, I decided to use it as a test bed. I submitted for GBI just to see if we, are, if we can get a building rated as a green building purely on passive systems without any active system. So there's no solar power, there's no advanced mechanical systems, everything's just natural. So what we did was um, we created a building that was using natural materials, um, like we use concrete blocks, which is low energy uh, embodied material without plaster and paint. So this material is actually very popular in low cost housing. Uh, but I use it in such a way that when it's done properly with good, good workmanship, it actually looks very good. And until today, 10 years later, I've not had to do any maintenance at all. Um, we've used uh, a lot of steel um, as a uh, passive solar screen device. Um, and the reason, reason being, 10 years ago, it was very difficult to get FSC certified timber. I couldn't find it. So, which is why I use uh, another material, which is steel uh, instead, right? Um, the other thing that we looked at is the building has to be, the ventilation has to be very, very good to allow for airflow. So I didn't want to take any risks. Once the design was done, we actually engaged a specialist to do wind flow analysis throughout the house. So you can see here, this is a, a ground floor plan, right? And you've got the dark blue to the red. Red means uh, the velocity of the air movement is quite fast. Dark blue is very slow, right? So if you look outside the building, you see the light green. So air movement outside the building is, is quite fast. As it enters the building, it slows down. So there's an opening here. You can see green, yellow, green. It slows down to light blue. And when it comes to the corner of the house, it, it, it goes to dark blue. So you see the dark blue region is, this is a storeroom and toilet, this is toilet, where there's not much uh, windows or ventilation. But the other areas, uh, there's good airflow. So this is what we wanted to do to prove that and to, to, to be sure that the sizes of openings and windows are sufficient. And we did studies for every single bedroom. This is the master bedroom. With the windows open, how would the air actually enter the room and leave? So again, this is um, scientific proof that, that uh, cross ventilation actually works. Uh, the staircase was designed such that it's open um, from below, air from below the staircase can actually enter into the house. I'll show you later in the photographs, but these were the analysis done. Um, so this is an image of the uh, living room. Living room has a high double volume ceiling and we like high, high ceilings because the hot air tends to go up towards the roof and cool air comes from below. And we had motorized windows, like in this corner there's a motorized window that allow for airflow, constant airflow. Uh, out of the building. Um, you can see that there is no paint use on the walls because we used the concrete blocks. All I did was skim coat it and left it natural. Um, yeah, so the main DNA, so to speak, of the building is the, the concrete blocks. And when we used steel, um, I didn't want to paint the steel either. So what I did was I, steel is going to naturally rust. So why not just let it rust? So we, we applied acid um, to get it to rust. So, and then we, we applied a sealer to prevent it from rusting further and we installed it. The only area where I actually had to use uh, Chengao timber was the bridge. You can see in this picture here that goes across the, 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 the pool. The pool water actually comes into the house to create uh, natural um, evaporation to cool the house. So, the only material that can, can last 
And I can say it, my, my Chengal timber until today, 10 years, is still in perfect condition. It is just one inch above the water level, right? And it's perfect. Um, the other thing you can see is that we don't have ceiling. Um, it's just off, com off from concrete, just lapped in a natural finish. Um, yeah, so this picture shows how the pool is actually designed right next to a house. It's, so it kind of acts like, an, like, a, like a heat sink um, and it allows evaporation and from evaporation, uh, cool air actually enters into the house. Um, of course, I did some experiments. I actually had from the pool water actually goes into the house. There's a tube that goes, that runs under the whole living room and comes out here. Um, the idea was that to use the pool water to cool the internal spaces. Um, this was an experiment. Uh, of course, my house, I can experiment. Lah. Somebody else's house, I can't. Um, and the effect was, my kids said that the pool water is cold. So I guess, I guess it didn't work too well. Um, the other thing is, if you see the floor, we use recycled stone. They are actually small, uh, they are actually wastage, small pieces, strips of, of, of stone that were laid together to look like uh, timber floorboards. So again, as I said, we can, if you want to find recycled materials to use as much as possible. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we couldn't get FSC certified timber. So throughout the house uh, on, on the upper levels where the bedrooms were, I use uh, bamboo flooring um, as it's a sustainable material. Um, and this image is the outdoor pool deck and you can see the staircase going up. In between the staircase, these gaps are filled with uh, mosquito netting uh, to, uh, to prevent mosquitoes from entering the, uh, the, the house, but it allows free flow of air coming in. So wherever possible, we took advantage of doing things like this. Even the, the gate or the door is not using glass, it's, it's perforated metal. So there's always constant um, airflow. I used carbonized uh, bamboo for the external deck, um, but unfortunately it didn't last. After five years, it started to rot. So now I've replaced it with balian, which is a much better and long lasting uh, material. I just took this image just recently on my handphone just to show you what has happened to our garden in the last 10 years. Um, what you see here in the background is our tree. We planted this tree, it was only six feet high um, when it was planted. And now it's about 30 feet and it's, it creates a natural, natural screen around the building. Um, this is the front, the trees, I planted trees uh, at the roadside. It's also 30 to 40 feet high. So. Apart from the metal screen that I have to reduce the solar impact into the house, trees also does the same thing. And the best part is it is so cheap, right? It only needs time and some tender living care for it to grow into something like this. Uh, the next project I want to talk about is the Jandabai Villas. Um, now, these were uh, two houses that we built in Janabai um, on a one acre piece of land each. Uh, Janabai, as you know, it's a very hilly area, very not natural, um, beautiful environment. So uh, we wanted to create a building that actually reacts to the, the environment and catches the, the views. So the image in front shows how we designed the walls to capture views at the same time to cut off heat coming from um, the, uh, the eastern facade and the western facade. Um, and that's the plan of the house, very organic plan. We did some 3D models to see how to do the massing, how to play with the roof to create shade. We did uh, solar analysis of the interiors. So in this picture here, we wanted the morning sun to come into the house, but by afternoon, uh, it cuts off the hot sun from coming into the house. Um, this is the picture of the house completed. So you can see the roof plays a, a vital part. It's like this big canopy. Um, and by doing this, I can have a lot of glass, a lot of nice uh, views and windows without uh, the glass ever becoming too hot uh, from, the, from the afternoon or evening sun. We use natural material like uh, concrete and bricks just left naturally. Um, so there's zero maintenance. 
uh, one of the things that we looked at was uh, how air actually entered into the, uh, the house. So we had these large open windows. The roof had uh, motorized windows at the top, uh, which allowed hot air to escape. And one of the things that we did was the client wanted a lift shaft um, in case he needed to fit a lift uh, in his old age. So instead of just leaving it as a shaft, I suggested, why not we make it into a feature? Let's make it into a wind chimney by extending the lift shaft over, over the roof and creating openings, we could allow air, cool air from outside to actually enter the building and enter the house. Uh, and he agreed. So this is the final effect. It's become quite a kind uh, quite iconic in Janabai. You've got this, these, these two chimneys that stand out and people actually wonder what it is, but actually it's a, it's a, it's a wind chimney. Um, this is the double, almost triple volume spaces we have in the living areas. And I mentioned earlier, these are the high level windows that are motorized, they can open to let air escape. This whole thing here is not glass, it's actually just mosquito netting. So there's free flow of air from outside coming into the house. Um, yeah, and we, we extended the brick into the house, so the bricks are also unpainted, the walls are unplastered, as natural as possible. This is the opening of the lift door. Uh, the future lift door. So what we did was we, we, we created this vent holes with, with again with mosquito netting so air can freely enter into the house uh, from the wind chimney above. The corridors, instead of putting glass windows, we, we just use, um, in this case, I think we use balau, balau timber with built-in mosquito netting. So you have free flow of air, but it keeps the insects and the bugs out. This is another image of that. We found that the site had um, natural uh, groundwater always constant, constantly going into the drains. So we decided to do a retention pond and, and the, the pond is always full, full of water because the water comes from the ground below. And what we did is we put in the pump and we used the water for irrigation of the garden. There was bamboo on the site and we decided to use the bamboo um, as a landscape lighting. And even in the bathroom, we use it as, as a shower stand. Um, how a building sits in its landscape is very important. I think uh, uh, this image shows that, you know, uh, the whole idea and the whole concept of this building, a very organic building, just sitting very naturally um, in the landscape. Um, the next house, uh, I want to talk about this Felon Chitty house. This is a house in UK, UK Heights. Um, I again developed this idea of the canopy, right? Uh, canopy, a natural uh, uh, canopy is a tree. Underneath the tree, animals seek, uh, seek shelter. And uh, this idea was used for this house. We looked at the structure of a leaf. And from the leaf, we developed uh, the structure into uh, a roof. So this this um, is a model of the roof that was built to see how the building structure can actually mimic a leaf. And from that from that leaf, underneath that leaf, all the, the living spaces were created. It had a central uh, lift shaft, which allowed uh, air to actually come in from the lower parts of the house and in, and escape to the to the roof. We had parts of the roof uh, glass to allow lighting to go through the basement and the lower areas of the house. So this is the uh, picture of the house from the front road. You hardly see it. All you see is this huge roof canopy and the house is actually tucked underneath the roof canopy. And that what, that's what it looks like on the inside. You have this huge um, roof canopy and we lined it with Nyato timber. Um, it's a beautiful material and um, you can see the steel members. These are all steel members that are exposed, which supports the entire roof. So the roof actually becomes not only just a roof, it becomes the wall. Where the roof starts and where the wall uh, starts or ends becomes very, very blurred. You can't tell the difference. Um, and where we had the lift, we used that area as a, a, a vertical uh, shaft for, for air ventilation to, to vent and stack and release to the roof. Uh, this is an image, you can see the glass roof here. So the light actually come, penetrates and goes into the lower levels of the house. 
So detail of the stack is uh, we created uh, areas where we have plenty of light. We created little courtyards with planting inside the house. We try to keep the dining areas outside the house. So it's actually uh, on the pavilion. So there is zero need for use of air conditioning. Uh, you know, if you have these uh, shutters that you can close in case it rains. Uh, so this is an image from below. You can see the pool below, um, big openings, sliding doors to allow the air to come through and enter into the house. We use timber louvers that are adjustable to allow uh, airflow and a big, large overhang to keep the sun out. So after developing this house, actually next door neighbor from this house on the right, uh, we built this, the, the second house called a canopy house based on the same concept. Um, and a different piece of land, but the same idea. We wanted uh, the roof to actually create shelter based on the sun orientation. We, we came up with a design that allowed for views, but kept the sun out. So from the front, this is all you see. You just see a roof, you park your car, and you descend down into the house. So this is a staircase that comes down and the roof actually gives you the shelter, right? So you don't need to have an enclosed space. It doesn't need to be with windows. You can just have an outdoor space, but protected from the weather. And when you enter, this is what you see. You've got the living spaces. It's got a study room with this beautiful uh, Nyato timber um, lined roof that acts like a huge canopy. And your views are opens up towards the outside and towards, um, they've got beautiful trees in the existing garden that we wanted to capture. Um, the other thing is on the high levels, you see here, these are all motorized uh, timber windows that they can, can open. There's actually a sensor up there. So when it rains, the, the windows shut by itself. And when it stops raining, it opens by itself. And that's the detail of the window. Bedrooms don't have ceiling, so you look up towards the, the roof. So there's always plenty of natural lighting coming into the rooms, into the spaces. Um, even the kitchen is all open. There's no, it's a, a very open concept house. So it's free airflow. You, even from the kitchen, you have views out. Um, the uh, barbecue areas are outside the house. You can see from this picture, when the doors are actually open, all these doors open, you can see the entertainment room, you can see the dining, and you can see the kitchen all the way to the end. So this whole space allows air to actually enter into the house freely. And it's got these big folding, timber folding doors that opens up towards the pool. These are beautiful trees that are on the site which we managed to preserve. Um, and they have a, quite, a, quite a close relationship to the building. Uh, I, I think this picture tells a tells the whole story about his house. On the right, you see the tree. And the left, you see a man-made version of the tree. Both are shelters. Uh, both have its own purpose. And the roof comes down to as if it's going to touch the ground, but it doesn't touch. And that's the picture of the house in, in the context of its environment, right? So we've managed to preserve these beautiful trees. Um, the next house I want to talk about is Funnel House. This is in Planters Haven. Um, again, a one acre piece of land. And we decided, you know, why not just do a single story building? Um, a semi-circular building with, uh, with the living spaces in the center of the house and all the rooms radiating uh, out of it. So the entrance is like a tunnel. You actually enter this tunnel that leads you into the house. So these are some of the sketches that we did, the, 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 the tunnel effect and how the building would sit in the landscape. Um, and the section of the house, the house is actually elevated above the ground by about uh, one or two feet. This is to allow cool air to actually enter the building from below. And we'll show you how we did this. Um, the tunnel actually acts as a, a, a ventilation funnel that allows air to come into the house and escape through the uh, high level windows. Now I talked about earlier about using brick walls. Uh, the problem with brick walls is 
thermal mass, right? So the, the, the heat that is absorbed into the walls is slowly dissipated into the house. So how to avoid this problem? What you do is you create a cavity wall. So there are two layers. There's an air gap in the middle. So this air gap acts as an insulation. So the inner wall is always cool. The outer wall heats up, but the heat doesn't enter the building. So this is what we did for the funnel house as well as the Jandabai house, same technique. And you can see the, the, the floor is actually just raised a few feet above the ground, right? To allow ventilation below the building. So what we did was we created this vent slots. Um, again, it was a bit of an experiment. These slots, you can open and close it. So if you're air conditioning the room, you can close it, but if you're not, you can leave it open. So cool air from below the house actually infiltrates into the house. It comes into the house at various parts of the house in different rooms and different spaces. This is the front of the house with the tunnel. And that's the timber screen that we did and the timber canopy. So this canopy just floats over the entrance of the house. Um, the materials that we used were natural concrete. You can see here, we use timber as a formwork. So you get this timber board effect, timber boards. Um, but it's actually a, a, a concrete wall. And that's not another view. So these, these timbers allows air to constantly come through. We've built in a mosquito netting. This is a detail of the timber and how it prevents mosquitoes from entering the house. This image on the left, this is not LED lights. It looks like LED lights, but actually it's a slot in the concrete wall and it's natural light coming into the house. You can see the effect of the timber imprint on the concrete here. So it looks like timber, but actually it's concrete. Um, these are the high level motorized windows that open up to allow air to escape from the house. And this is a picture of the living space. You can see this, the roof is floating above the, the house. This allows for indirect light. So you have lighting coming from all around the space and hot air, can, hot air can still escape through the motorized windows. These sliding doors open, so with the pool, you get evaporative cooling and cool air actually entering into the house. This is a picture from above. You can see that we've, we've fitted, this house is fitted with uh, PV cells, uh, so we can actually feed it back to, to TNB. And that's a view of the house from the garden. You see how the house sits very naturally on the on its in its natural surrounding. We did not change any of the platform levels. This was left all natural. Um, that's a picture of the existing durian tree, very nice durian tree, and the owner. Um, subsequent to that, we developed the boomerang house. Um, uh, now it's called boomerang house because of the shape of the roof. Um, Again, the roof played a very dominant role. That's a natural topography. It's actually on a on a quite a steep slope, sitting sitting above. So, the owner is a French French guy, and he wanted to spend most of his time outside the house. So we had to make sure that the roof uh, created enough um, shade so that he could do that. We use uh, solar solar shading devices like uh, steel screens. Um, to allow uh, fresh air to enter, but keep the sun out. So this is a study that we did. Once the roof was designed, we wanted to make sure that this area around the pool was constantly covered and naturally sheltered. So we did a morning, afternoon, and evening study to see how, um, how we could create shade. This is an actual picture after the building was finished. So you can see it allows the morning sun to actually come in a little bit because we want some sunlight in the morning. In the afternoon, there's no sun at all because the, the roof creates a shade. And in fact, you get this bounce uh, light from the pool, which creates a very interesting uh, reflection on the roof. And in the evening, you get a totally different feel. With the lights on, you get the shadows of the plants reflected on the roof. So you can see it's very open. These um, collapsible doors allows the living room and dining to, 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 to integrate with the garden and with the pool. So it's almost seamless, you know, this indoor-outdoor experience that you get. 
Um, these are the solar shading devices that we use, perforated steel, so it cuts, cuts down the heat coming into the house. So even the bathroom, there are no windows, just these perforated screen, and that's it. Natural uh, ventilation all the time. Open air bathrooms that we created, integrated with the garden. And yeah, so this is a picture of how the living and the dining areas uh, are totally open out towards the outdoor decking in the outdoor area. So this area here is always constantly under shade. That was the whole concept. And that's the image of the uh, front of the house. And that's how it sits on the landscape. Okay, uh, apart from bungalows, we also do other projects. Uh, recently, we just started this project. Manara UBB is now um, under construction. It's at the piling stage. This site is uh, located uh, in just off Jalan Yap Kwan Singh, and it's a, a walking distance from KLCC, very close. Um, what we wanted to do with this building, again, we see a lot of our office towers in, in KL being very, very Western in its design, meaning that it's all glass, right? But in Malaysia, we have a lot of heat. Um, so how can we design uh, an office tower that uses a passive system, you know, uh, to reduce the, the heat and the glare entering the building? And we, if we go back to the early days, you know, Diabumi and Parliament building, these buildings were built with passive design. So the glass and the windows are actually set back inside. So you had shading all the time, right? Without the building actually overheating. We looked at, you know, bamboo weaving techniques um, and, and local patterns in terms of how we want to design the, um, this, the secondary skin of the building. I came up with some sketches, some ideas. We came up, our early um, idea was using a, a kinetic facade, which actually moves. So the building actually had these, um, and we were we were looking at composite timber, and these screens actually rotate every hour um, to prevent the sun from actually entering inside. So you had a, a facade that changes with time, right? Um, early on, the client was actually quite quite excited, and they wanted to do this, but eventually, I think they chickened out <laughs> because um, I think they were more worried about the maintenance of the uh, the motto. So to, 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 to keep this running constantly. So in the end, we opted for something in the middle. It was a, a screen wall, but it's fixed using um, aluminum shutters. So this is the, uh, this section here shows the internal skin and the external skin is where the, the aluminum shutters would be. We also um, implemented a catwalk for cleaning of windows, because one of the problems with all this, our, our glass skyscrapers is that cleaning the windows is extremely difficult and extremely dangerous, right? So by having built-in platforms, workers can come in easily and clean the windows. Uh, this is a model that was built finally of the, of the building. Uh, because it's a, it's a very small footprint, the, the building footprint is only about 12,000 square feet. So we created uh, mechanical car parks. So these car parks will be all fully automated mechanical car parks. Um, so again, you we reduce the carbon footprint by not having real physical car parks, which, which would take a lot of space. Um, you can see the detail of the, the aluminum shutters. The walls would be built with no plastering and no paint, just off form concrete uh, using Myvan uh, form work. Uh, we want the interiors, the, the lobby, to be fully naturally ventilated. So again, we use high, high ceiling, high volume ceiling. We use uh, HVS, uh, you know, those big ass fans to, to, to help create ventilation. We use off form concrete and natural bricks as the main material. Even the lift lobby, we have ventilated windows, so there's no need for air conditioning. We have duplex uh, office um, in the building. And the idea was by having a duplex, you have not only have high ceiling, light is able to penetrate deep into the office. So you don't have a situation where the center of the office is usually the center of the office is always dark, the sign of light. So in this case, light can actually come in uh, right through the building. 
Uh, lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about the future of housing. Where are we at today? Um, and what can we do in the future? Um, this is a project that we did. Uh, it was a competition organized by Saim Dhabi, um, the future of the terrace house, and we participated. All the ideas that we talked about was implemented in, in this design. And uh, what we did was um, we, we tried to redefine what the future terrace house might look like and might, might be. Um, we went back to the sunflower. The sunflower actually tracks the sun. So this process is called heliotrophy. So we call it the heliotropic house. The reason being um, at the roof level, we had a series of solar panels and these solar panels are motorized. They actually track the sun. So the efficiency increases. So it does two things. Not only does the, your, your energy gain is much higher or you have a much higher efficiency, but at the same time, it acts as a secondary skin to the building. It protects the, the glass facade. It protects the roof from overheating. And the central core of the house, where we have the staircase and, and the space for a lift if the owner needs it, has got no roof. It is just open to the sky. It's got a water feature to collect water. And uh, when it rains, these mot motorized um, solar shading device will close. Right? And you had this high ceiling, uh, high double volume space. Um, we also re-looked at the conventional terrace house and versus houses of the future. With the same number of units, just by reconfiguring the existing uh, layout, existing houses, you've got this 40 feet or 50 feet frontage road, and you have a 10% area requirement for Kaosan Lapang. Just by getting rid of this road, if we change the back lanes into our road vehicle access, the main roads can be converted into big parks. So this is what we did. We had back lanes for you to go and park your car. So basically you park the car at the back of your house. The front of your house actually now faces parks, linear parks where we could have futsal courts, we could have pools, water features, playgrounds, whatever amenities. And um, we found that the green areas from 10% was increased to 25% just by changing the configuration. Yeah, so that's a section of how this works. So car park at the back lane. So the front of the house has a park and the house, you know, connects and relates to the park. And these were the design strategies that were implemented. Uh, natural lighting, um, adaptability. Ad adaptability is going to be something that's very important in the future where houses you don't need to move out or you don't need to renovate or demolish your house. You can just change the interior configurations. Uh, double skin facade, uh, improving the green areas, visual connection, community linkages will be very important in the future. By having parks, you have a, you, you build a community. Um, so these, and construction methods, we have to relook at construction methods, maybe using IBS methods. And this is a view of what it might look like, might, might look like the park in the center. With, uh, with a pool or pond. And these solar panels come in different patterns and you can choose the pattern that you like so that you get a sense of uh, variation in, in the facade. And that's the section, car park below, and then this courtyard in the center of the house, which is open to the sky and how the solar panels actually reduce uh, solar gain into the building. And we had a green facade facing the car parking or the so-called back lane of the house. Um, and the house would be totally customizable. So the different color shows different usage of the, of the house. Uh, this is just a depiction of how different families could, could reconfigurate the house according to what they like. So for example, bedrooms will come with partition system. You, you could create two bedrooms or you could create one single master bedroom or you could create an office or you could create uh, an AV room or whatever purpose that you need using a flexible partition system. So just some ideas of, of different people, the same house, but different configuration that can be used. I'm not gonna go into it. So much uh, and methods of construction will in the future. I think we will, we cannot rely on on uh, labor 
too much of labor because uh, it's not sustainable. We have to look at IBS systems, precast methods, um, which are simpler and faster to construct. So using uh, prefab uh, concrete slabs, prefab uh, SIPS system, which is um, structural uh, insulated panels for your floor and your wall. Uh, and this allows total flexibility within the building. You can actually take this out in future without having to do major hacking works. Very simple to do. Some of the details of this. And the, uh, mod, the um, partition system that can be, can be interchanged. We even looked at uh, the floor and the walls actually acting as battery storage from the sun. You can collect it and store it in the, in the floor. Uh, technology will take a, a bigger role in future where we have, you know, you go to the toilet and the toilet can actually detect if you, if you, um, you are sick, you know, just by testing your urine, for example. Um, we have um, systems that can check the weather to, you know, for you to predict what the weather, weather is going to be like. Uh, so you can you can monitor the storage of water that you collect from your rainwater housing systems. So all these systems will be actually integrated with the building, and the building will have to be zero carbon in the future. So we have to go back to biophilic principles, what I talked about earlier. All this passive system will have to be provided. Not only the passive system, we also have to add on active systems. So uh, this section shows the passive system is like ventilation how I enter the buildings and actually escape out uh, through the roof. Uh, we have solar panels, we have rainwater housing systems, um, a whole lot of systems uh, that need to be implemented to create this. Uh, even composting system at the roof level, we have uh, urban farming. Um, even incinerators might be something that we may have to consider in the future, where every block of house will have a, a, a mini incin incinerator where you throw your rubbish. Uh, items that cannot be recycled are then incinerated. Water efficiency, we have to look at water uh, efficiency in terms of rainwater housing systems. Um, and it, it will all have to be automated, right? Uh, these are some of the perspectives of the spaces with high double volume ceilings, uh, courtyard in the center of the house, green facades. Okay, and finally, I just wanna end this talk by uh, going back to our early image. We are now in 2022. What we do and all the measures that we take in terms of um, how we design buildings for the future is gonna make a huge difference in what is the outcome in 2050. So hopefully we make the right decisions and do the right things and take the right steps and this is something that everybody can do from simply just planting a tree to actually designing green homes. We all should take an active role. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Architect Melvin, for that very insightful presentation. So now we will proceed with the uh, Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder, uh, for those that want to send a question, please send your question via the Q&A box and we will go through it as many as possible. So let's see um, what question that we have here. Uh, from Chen Ming Tan, which are the most recommended uh, timber finishes? And timber how to, yeah, and how to prevent timber defects caused by insects such as beetles, termites, and does timber requires regular care? All right, okay. So timber, there, there are different grades of timber, naturally durable timber, and not so durable, right? So if you use naturally uh, durable timber like uh, Chengal or Balau, they do not need any care. Uh, you saw the Chengal uh, timber bridge that I did in my house. I did not paint it. I did not put any varnish. I did not do anything. It was just left natural. And until today, it is, it is in perfect condition. But obviously you cannot do the same for not so durable. Like for example, like, uh, timbers, hardwood timbers that are not so durable, maybe like Nyato, may need to be treated, right? Um, you can do kin drying is one method of treating it. Um, you need to treat kin drying because you don't want the timber to have any wood borers because wood borers that's inside the timber can actually 
destroy the timber. Um, so you have to be careful with things like that. So when specifying timber and using timber, you've got to use it, uh, the right timber for the right place. So external, you've got to go for more durable. Internal, you can go for less durable, uh, which are more aesthetic, but, um, but they also have durability issues. So you, you've got to see both. Okay, uh, from Mr. George Yi. Good morning, Architect Melvin. Um, I am from Wood Tech Design. May I know the concept suitable for low cost building, terrace, and high rise building? Uh, low cost methods for what? Low cost building, terrace, terrace, and high rise building. Know the concept suitable for George Yi, Wood Tech Design. May I know the concept suitable? What concept suitable is that? Don't really understand the question. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you need he to needs to elaborate exactly what he's, uh, yeah. he means a little bit more. Okay, uh, we passed that. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, what do you think people look forward to for the design expectation in the future? Um, like I've shown before in our presentation, I think in the future, the expectation is that houses need to be uh, green. They need to be basically in the future, you are looking at zero carbon, right? So buildings that can produce renewable energy from renewable sources um, so that your, your consumption is not greater than what you produce. Um, building materials will need to be selected very carefully to ensure that the impact on, on resources is limited, right? So you have to go with natural materials that are renewable. Uh, we have got to look at technology as well. Like I mentioned earlier, CLT is, is I think, uh, a material of the future um, because we're using timber, which is from a renewable source, but we're using it in a different way. We're making it actually very structural, very strong, and 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 um, but in Malaysia, we have to also consider uh, the tropics. Whether CLT will do well in Malaysia, I do not know. It's still early stage, so research needs to be done on that. Mm, okay. Next, from Mr. Ng Sefban, he sent out lots of questions here. Uh, could we know the uh, price square foot of those building, um, referring to each of the bungalow? Bangalore, and um, is there any cost study or cost comparison between conventional link house and this future proposed link? Uh, if yes, what is the result? Hmm. Okay, interesting question. Now, in terms of cost uh, per square foot, every house varies. Uh, it varies very much depending on the design, the complexity, the finishes. So uh, the houses that we do generally you know, uh, ranges from 400 to maybe seven, 800 per square foot, depending on the design, right? And the specifications used. Now, of course, uh, what I showed you earlier, the terrace houses that we're using in the future will not be cheap because of the systems that will be implemented. But the way I look at it is that in the future, maybe people will not live in bungalows anymore or in semi-detached houses um, because of, of space, you will need to live in terrace houses. So terrace houses can be de designed such that it's just the same as living as in, in a bungalow or in a big house. Um, I won't say that this is a solution for everybody. Um, mass housing will still be required. Um, but what we hope is that in the future that we will not concentrate so much on high rise because I believe that uh, the connection with the earth and with the ground is very important, right? We can still build low cost um, without going too high or, 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 or increasing the density so much. Uh, so maybe these are things that we need to consider. Maybe we need to consider living out of the city. You know, we, we, everyone wants to live in the city, but the fact is cities are growing. Populations are reaching stages where it's uncontrollable. We need to actually learn to live outside the city where land cost is cheaper and we can build at a lower density. Okay, uh, we go back to the previous question from Josh Lee, where he asked on uh, the suitable concept for low cost building, 
uh, terrace and high rise building, he continued uh, his comment. He said, uh, the sustainable design, especially the, the air movement for the building type, uh, because I saw that the slide mostly shown a uh, bungalow type building. Yeah, I mean, our last uh, uh, project we shared was a, a, a terrace house. Um, I think when you're looking at low cost, you have to look at the passive system because as I said earlier, passive system virtually has no cost. It doesn't cost much to plant, right? So you want to increase your green areas. You want to try to find ways of integrating the green areas with your designs, whether you are 10 stories above the ground or you are on the ground, we can actually create green, green areas within uh, apartment blocks, for example, all right? If we, if we are talking about low cost, or if you're talking about high density, um, it's not difficult to design windows and doors that open up fully to allow the breeze to come in, right? So you can reduce the use of air conditioning, um, how you treat the building skin, how you, I mean, the, this whole process that I talked about earlier in passive design can be used for low cost, right? But with using uh, lower cost materials. Yeah, so it, it's just that how you, you, you plan it and how you use those materials is important. But the underlying thing is design because without passive design, um, uh, we, are, we are not doing things the correct way, especially with the current situation with global warming. So that is the, the main underlying crux of it. Mm, okay, next, uh, from Aria, among all the projects that you have shown in the presentation slide, which one is your favorite and <laughs> why? <laughs> all right, well, I guess I, get, I, I gotta say it's my own house because uh, my house uh, was designed 10 years ago and it is still relevant today. Um, and it's built out of simple materials. Um, when, I, when I first built it, uh, my family was quite worried because they said, oh, no plaster, no paint, no nothing. It's uh, like living in a concrete house. But once it was built, uh, they actually can understand and appreciate why it was done that way. Um, so a lot of the ideas that I use in our dis current designs actually came from the house uh, because with the house, I can experiment. I can see what works, what doesn't work and how to fine tune and improve things from there. Hope that answer, Arya. <laughs> okay, uh, next from Amina. I would like to ask, what is a typical timber structure lifespan compared to concrete? Uh, good question. Um, you only have to look back at what we have today in Malaysia. If you look at the kampung houses, there are kampung houses that are over 100 years old and the timber is actually still in perfectly good condition. So what this tells you is if you use the right type of timber, really good durable timber, they can last a very long time. Um, of course, concrete can last. We, we already have records of concrete lasting um, what a few hundred years. If you go back to the early Roman structures, um, I think the Pantheon roof was built out of concrete. It is still standing today. So we know concrete has a very, very huge lifespan, but timber, we can only look back at our records, right? So over a hundred years, no problem if you're using the right species and the right type of timber. Hope that answer. And uh, from Mr. Singh, what do you think about high rise being built in timber? Like what's beginning, ha uh, what is happening in Europe? Some people say it's wasteful, but some disagree. Your thought? Okay, it's certainly not wasteful because timber, like I said earlier, is a renewable resource. So as long as we don't do over um, logging, we are, we are the, the forests are, are managed in a sustainable way. Every tree that is cut is replaced. Then we are doing okay. Why is timber so popular in Europe? Is because their trees compared to Malaysian trees are very fast growing. Uh, Softwood is very fast growing. So they, they're, they're using timber and they, by changing the technology of it, uh, what they mean by cross laminated is that the timber grains run in opposite directions. So that gives the timber a very, very 
strong uh, uh, physical strength to take a lot of load. Um, as well as I believe, and from what I understand, they do not burn easily. Even if they catch fire, only the external skin catches fire. The internal is still preserved. So, but it's still early days. Um, more research needs to be done. And how the CLT react in the tropical climate, we still don't know because we've never tested it. Um, but I, like I said earlier, we, we need a body to look into it. Maybe MTC might be the, the right uh, um, uh, body to look into this and do some research on CLT because I think really it is uh, the material of the future. Okay, last question of the day. What is the level of awareness for green building in Malaysia, in your opinion? I think among architects, uh, I think all of us know it very well. Uh, the general public still, still needs a lot of education. Uh, even our clients, when we talk out to our clients about doing green buildings, um, they only think, oh, green building means solar cells. In their mind, it's just that, you know, solar cells to generate energy. They don't think beyond that. So it needs a lot of education. Um, the, I mentioned earlier this, 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 this fear of maintenance and things like that. Like, oh, if I do this, I have to maintain it. Um, we are at a state currently where we have, we, are, we have no choice in this matter anymore. Green buildings is a must. Uh, it is required and it yes of course like everything else it requires maintenance but this is something that we still have, we, we have to do in order to save the planet I guess no more questions here so yeah we have come to the end of our webinar session today and thank you all for the questions uh, before we end is there any final words from you uh, Akita Melvin to the audience uh, I think just to recap again, I think um, we should not be waiting for government agencies to do things. Uh, we all can do our small part. Even if you're living in a small, tiny apartment, if you can plant, you know, even potted plants, anything that is green is the, is the smallest way we can all do something in greening our planet. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of the Malaysian Timber Council, uh, we would like to thank architect Melvin for taking his time to share his knowledge and insight at this webinar. And for information, there will be a live feedback poll later uh, for you guys. So please, uh, it will be grateful if you could kindly answer uh, the feedback poll uh, so that we can improve our future event. And as mentioned earlier, this recording will be uploaded into our uh, MPC Timber TV YouTube channel. So please do check it out later. And also I wish to, um, if you would want to know the latest happening on MPC, do follow and like our MPC social media platform. We have Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website. And we have various activities lined up this year. So do check us out and get the latest updates related to MPC as well as on the timber industry. I hope you find this session insightful and thank you everyone once again uh, for joining us today. I, uh, we really appreciate your participation and hope uh, to see you again in our next uh, Timber Talk series, which is tentatively uh, scheduled in November. So that's all from us today. May you have a wonderful day and here's wishing everyone a happy weekend again. Thank you.